Hello and welcome to the TIFO Football Podcast. I'm Joe Devine and I'm joined now by Seb stafford Blore. Hello, Joe Devine. Hello. Uh, we were joined by Tim Spears today, the wonderful Tim Spears. Um, what did we talk about, Seb? All sorts of things. We uh, covered the very unfortunate situation with Raheem Jimenez after his injury at Arsenal. We talked about how Fabio Silva might replace him. Let's talk a little about, a bit about who Fabio Silva actually is, because uh, a very expensive player, supposedly a very, very good one, but someone we know very little about. He doesn't even have a particularly good YouTube compilation, which yeah. must make him the only player in Europe not to. But that adds to the sort of the sense of mystery with him. Uh, we're told he's yes. very talented, and I guess we're about to find out just uh, how talented he is. I love a mystery, Seb. You do love a mystery. Uh, you also like a very detailed explanation of conditioning in football teams, don't you? I think you do, anyway. I, d- I like it when Tim does it. Yeah, and Tim does it really well. We, we revisit a, uh, an article he wrote about a year ago, which explains how footballers deal with short turnarounds and fixture congestion. It's absolutely fascinating. It really is. And do you know something else that's really good at dealing with quick turnaround and congestion uh, fixtures? Congestion? That wasn't your best. <laughs> <laughs> it's The Athletic. Uh, actually, this is, we have a genuinely good deal on at the moment. Until Friday, I believe Friday the 4th, uh, we have a sort of Black Friday, Cyber Monday extended deal. £1 per month for 12 months or for the first 12 months. Uh, so it's £12 for the first year. That is an exceptional deal. If you visit theathletic.com forward slash TIFO, you can take uh, part in that deal and uh, enjoy it to uh, to its greatest effects. If you're a Wolves supporter, for example, and you want to read Tim, which you should do even if you're not, uh, you can read Tim every day. That guy is the, is the best. He's the best. Hey, hey, that guy, he's the best. Oh, also, uh, something worth uh, listening to, part of The Athletic, is uh, is the Molyneux View, which, um, which Tim is part of the Wolves podcast uh, every week. It's a really, really good one, uh, so check out the Molyneux View. In fact, you don't have to be a subscriber to listen to that, so uh, you can search for that or wherever you find your normal podcasts. Without further ado, let's let's uh, let's be joined by Tim now. Uh, and uh, as we say, we start with the with the with the genuinely horrific situation with uh, with Raul Jimenez. Although we hear that early uh, signs are positive in terms of recovery, so that's good. But um, I'll leave you now in the, uh, the cool hands and the warm embrace of uh, the wonderful Tim Spears. Okay, Tim, obvious starting point. What do we know about Raul Jimenez at the moment? How's he doing? Um, the early signs are, are positive um, and, and, you know, cautiously encouraging. And um, that kind of started really immediately after full time when Nuno said, you know, that he was he was up and talking and, and, and conscious. And, yeah, he's undergone surgery almost immediately. And he's managed to see his, his partner, Daniela, who uh, who went down to London uh, as soon as the incident happened, and then uh, a, a tweet has, has come out last night from him and his account in which he's kind of said, uh, "Thanks for your for your messages. I'll be under observation and and hope to return to the pitch soon." So, yeah, he'll be he'll be in hospital for the next few, few days at least, uh, undergoing a lot of tests and observation. Um, but yeah, f- fingers crossed at the moment. It does seem kind of cautiously optimistic. How was Nuno afterwards? Because I was I was watching the game on television and. Whilst Jimenez was being treated, obviously the camera cut to uh, to Nuno and his support staff. I don't even know what I'm, I'm I'm trying to ask. Actually, it just seems such a such a horrible thing. And also, for a manager, you have a kind of burden of responsibility, and you kind of have a, a loco and parentis thing going on in in that situation. What was he like at full time when you um, presumably zoomed him? He's a very sort of emotional man, really. I think he I think he he, he tries to hide it with the media, but. But it but it does come out, and you, you you know you couldn't help but notice that his mind was elsewhere, and I thought the same during the game when the camera kind of panned to him, and you know his eyes looked really soft, and he was sort of staring into the distance, you know, while there was that horrible sort of ten minute delay while they were attending to him and us on the field, and yeah, post match, um, again you could kind of tell his mind was elsewhere. The the, the press conference with the written press um, was kind of cut short halfway through because he kind of took a phone call from the. From the club doctor Matthew Perry, um, you know they're a, they're a very close knit group in terms of staff and players. You know, it's everybody says it, don't they? But but they really are, and that's something that he's fostered over three or four years now. And you know, we we hear a lot about their small squad, 
one of the main reasons behind that is because he wants such a tight knit close group so they're all, all very close to each other and um Unfortunately, with the coronavirus situation as well at the moment, I don't I don't believe he can go and visit Raoul, which is which is such a shame. Um, so um, so yeah, he's he's he is an emotional man, and I've, I've noticed that this year actually throughout the pandemic, it's really kind of affected him, and, and he's kind of he's wore it heavy on his on his shoulders and not really been able to hide that. So um, his kind of mean facade that he's that he's conjured up over the past few years has started to slip a bit, and we're really starting to see uh, the real man. So um, so yeah, very emotional times. A couple of years ago, I covered the Hull City Chelsea game at Stamford Bridge where Ryan Mason suffered his career ending injury. And along with Fabrice Mwamba, it's the worst thing I've seen at football just because it's incredibly shocking. The noise is just horrible. You, you, don't, you don't really forget that. Also, it's, 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 it's weird because I, I don't know how you cope with that as a fellow professional. So you're, you, you're in the game. You're doing something normal like where you watch one of your teammates do something normal like compete for a header in his own penalty box and suffer an injury which just i mean fantastic that he seems to be on the road to recovery but just looked horrendous i don't know how as a professional you refocus and you you compete in the way that uh in the way that's necessary to to win a premier league game um i don't obviously want to trivialize what happened to Raheem and as is, is a kind of a, a generic obstacle in on the path to victory but i thought the way that Wolves did refocus and did recover from that, and the performance they subsequently put in was incredibly impressive. Yeah, obviously, on on the one hand, they must have been thinking about their about their good friend, and on the other, they've got to try and focus on the futility of of playing a football match. Um, and yeah, they, they they did manage to do that absolutely. I thought um, after that that spell, you always get of, of 15 to 20 minutes where you know the game's in a real lull. They coped with. With the after effects of that, far better than Arsenal, and 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 produced a, a great performance for the rest of that half. And then they've come in at half time, and the first thing they want to ask about is 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 their friend Raúl Jiménez, and you know they've got they're trying to get updates from that, and then they've got to go back out in the second half and and do the same again. So I struggle to comprehend how yeah how they managed to focus on doing that. I guess you just got to try and shut it out as much as you can and and get on with uh, get on with your job. Did you feel like it um, it completely took away your your appetite for football? Even as a, even as a, either as a supporter or a journalist, or you just when something like that happens, you think just stop. Do you, do you see what I'm getting at? It's it's yeah, just a, it's a I've, very absolutely. weird feeling in the aftermath. I I physically felt sick actually, and, and and I was I was I was just at home, and um and I I, I was obviously speaking to um speaking to a couple of people at work about you know what we're kind of do with the situation, and lots of people texting me asking what's going on and. And yeah, you, you're supposed to be trying to watch a football match, and yeah, I, I, I did. I felt quite nauseous for the rest of that first half. Actually, I couldn't get that sound out, out of my head, and I'm sure a lot of other people yeah. were the same. It was it was just uh, just sickening. Um, yeah, I, I you know I really try and get involved and engrossed in football matches and, and tweet like an idiot and and put the caps lock on and 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 and, and, and Wolves Wolf scored two first half goals, which which they haven't done for for months. And they're terrible in the first half, and there were these amazing things happening on the pitch, and just couldn't really get excited about it, really. And uh, getting lots of replies from fans saying, uh, "Just, just, I've got no interest in this match. Can you just tell me how Raúl Jiménez is, please?" And just immediately puts everything into uh, into perspective. It's a shame because it was a terrific performance. And let's 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 let's, let's pivot to something a little bit brighter. Um, Daniel Podence, he's a star, man. He, he's he's uh, he's one of those players that. At any point in history, drop him onto a football pitch in front of a set of fans or a TV audience, and he entertains you. He's got that like kind of that low center of gravity, the skill set. You just think, I want to watch you play. Um, and he was excellent. He's been excellent since he arrived. I, mean, I appreciate that he's had a bit of a a staggered uh, entry, and he's had to condition himself properly, and he's moved around. But he's just he looks like a looks like an excellent player. He likes to entertain. And he, I mean, he nutmegged Kevin De Bruyne a few weeks ago, which which he didn't need to. And <laughs> bold, I thought, I thought, bold move. <laughs> I thought that was quite wonderful. And um, yeah, him and him and Pedro Neto have both kind of gone under the radar a little bit. Probably not helped by you know Wolves's poor start to the season, in which they've had you know little help around them on the field, and there's been lots of adjustments this season, and mostly by the fact I think that they're they're playing with two new wing backs and. Um, you know, they played with Matt Doherty and Johnny Castrotto for for two seasons now, and they're such a pivotal, such such a pivotal part in Wolves' attacks down down those flanks, and that's who Penence and Neto and Jota would be combining with. And now you've got Semedo. Well, in fact, they've used seven players in the two wing back positions already this season. 
So that's that's kind of hindered them. But we have seen little moments from Pedence here and there. And yeah, he's kind of ad- adopted a new role in the past two games in this in this tactical revolution we've seen at Molyneux, a 4-2-3-1, this formation we've not seen for years. Um, they've finally ditched three at the back and uh, they look better for it. And Pedence and Neto have been two of the main beneficiaries of that. They're, they're, they're playing with more freedom. And I thought the combination play they produced with Traore was was sublime, actually. And um, they uh, Arsenal didn't know how to cope at times. I thought, you know, they, they've all got pace, they've all got trickery, they've all got vision, they've all got awareness. And uh, it's a tantalising prospect for, for the coming weeks if, if they can keep that up. To me, it was one of Traore's best performances of the season. And there's been a little bit of, um, not noise, but there's been a little bit of discussion about his morale uh, and there's been some sort, of, sort of whispers about attitude and uh, differences of, of opinion. Um, what's his relationship with the club like at the moment? Is it back on track? Yeah, I think I think in terms of of the the, the playing staff and training and working with Nuno, I, 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 I think it's been okay. Um, but yeah, we did do a story uh, two three weeks ago with the suggestion being that Traore thought he was being left out of the team because he hasn't signed a new contract. So it's an unusual situation for Wolves. They've been they've been very good at tying down players onto five year contracts since uh, since Nuno and well and George Mendes kind of got involved in this a few years ago, and it's the first one first player who's been reluctant to sign a new deal. We gather there's a, a slight issue in terms of Wolves not offering as much as Traore thinks he's worth, and it's it's coincided with him dipping out the team. Now, for me. And from what I understand, that's purely on for football reasons. And Nuno is not the type of manager to leave a player out because he hasn't signed a new contract. He doesn't deal with that side of it for a start. He's he's not a manager in the slightest. You know, he's very much a head coach. Doesn't get involved in those things because he leaves it to his very good friend George Mendes. You know, a lot of the time. Um, there's a slight complication here in that Traore is one of very few players at Wolves who whose agent is not George Mendes. Um, which perhaps is a bit of a complicating factor. Does so, he have um, yeah. to sit on like a separate table at training? Like, <laughs> is he not? Is he not allowed to, to eat with the others in the canteen? He has to have a, a separate building. Yeah, he's got a different wristband to everyone else. So there's, there's certain rooms he's not allowed entry into. Um, but hey, he's got three years left on his contract. There's no there's no immediate priority to do that. But um, but he hasn't been hasn't been producing on the pitch for for a while. Um, I mean, he's not scored in the league since last December. It's it's coming up to a year now, and that's is that against Spurs? Uh, those last goal in the league. That was the that was the Man City game when City went two 0 up, but we're down to ten men. He'd had this amazing purple patch for about two or three months, where every single week you knew he was going to do something ridiculous, and um, about 20, 20 players had been booked for fouling him at that point du- during that season. That was the only way to stop him, and yeah, since then. The, the the old Traore end product conundrum has, has kind of come back really and, and no assist since June and I know it's not it's not about assists and goals at, at all and in fact you saw that on on um, Sunday night against Arsenal because he didn't produce an assist but without him neither of those goals happened so I think he suffered a bit with a slight change in formation this season they've sort of gone to a narrower two up front at times with with Neto supporting from midfield which doesn't suit Traore's game you know he's very much a, a right winger and. A four-two-three-one will will accentuate his strengths far more, I think, and um, and relinquish him of some defensive juices, which is not a strong point either. The first time I interviewed Neymar, he was fourteen. He was pretty much famous, approaching household name status before he'd even played for the Santos first team. Barca should have been better prepared. They really did not have a contingency plan for if Neymar were to leave. You had the French president Emmanuel Macron calling it really good news on the day. Without selling Coutinho for that amount of money, Liverpool's recent history would be very, very different. But then again, Neymar changed the whole dynamic. I'm Adam Leventhal, and this is Beyond the Headline, Neymar, the transfer that changed the world. Over the next three episodes, we will explore Neymar's 222 million euro move from Barcelona to Paris Saint-Germain, a transfer that changed the game not only because it more than doubled the world transfer record, but explain how the ripple effects made it arguably the most significant transfer in the history of the game. That's Beyond the Headline, available wherever you get your podcasts or get it ad-free via the Athletic app.
move on to Fabio Silva because um, obviously Raul Jimenez is uh, going to be out for the foreseeable future. Silva fascinates me because all I really know about him is that he cost in excess of £30 million, um, that he has one senior league goal to his name and one league start in um, in Portugal. He's got a sort of, um, um, I think, 10 or 15 substitute appearances too, but he's incredibly inexperienced. He's one of the most experienced players I've known to, to command that kind of fee. Let's start at the beginning. How, how did the transfer um, come about? And also, what is it that Wolves see in him? They've been looking at him for, for, for a couple of years. You know, I think with... When Wolf signed a Mendes client, the the suggestion is just that he's been presented to them by Mendes, you know, with with some kind of PowerPoint presentation accompanying it as, as to his strengths and weaknesses. And uh, you know, certainly not the case with Fabio Silva. He's been he's been scouted for a couple of years, mostly for the uh, Portugal sort of under seventeens and under eighteens, and he's got a, a prolific record at youth level. In and around the game, he's been touted as one of um, as one of the best strikers of his of his generation or of his age group in terms of his goal record, his clinical ability in and around the box. And Wolves have looked at him for some time, but always thought that he would never be attainable um, because of his potential, because of the fact that Porto would tend to blood players for you know at least a couple of seasons before before being willing to sell. But a lot of things came together in the summer in terms of um, Porto needing needing to raise funds, I gather for FFP issues. You know they had a bit of a fire sale. And it was made aware to Wolves that he could be available for around for around thirty thirty five million pounds. The scouting team and the recruitment team were, were kind of asked at this point, you know, if 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 there was a deal here to be done, should we sign him? And their immediate answer was was yes, a- a- absolutely. And um, like I said, there was a general feeling across across clubs across Europe really that he just wouldn't be available for sale at, at this point, and that he would have to play for Porto for a couple of years, and then probably cost quite a lot of money. Is this one of the situations where, like, in a post-pandemic world, there's a lot of teams out there who, under normal circumstances, would probably happily bid for a player like that, but at the moment aren't really in the market to take a... You know, because he, he talented as he may be, he's still a bit of a project. He's someone that you probably won't get a, a huge return on for a couple of years. Is, is it one of those, basically, in inverted commas? Yeah, it, it, it certainly feels that way. Wolves weren't planning on, on buying him this summer either, and... I think they know, well, yeah, they do know he's not worth £35 million now. They know they've paid over the odds for him, but they, they believe in two, three, four years' time, you know, he could be worth more than his buyout clause at Porto, which was, which was I think, around £110 million. Pounds. You know, they, they think he's got a sort of a Joe Felix um, projectory in in him. Um, and this is centred around his his goal-scoring record primarily. He's very much a, a number nine you know, he's, he's different to Raul Jimenez in that he's not going to come deep necessarily, and 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 well, he, he will come deep and link play, but that's not his major strength. You know, they want him in and around the box to finish off these chances. So there is a kind of an issue there that that they might have to change their style if if Fabio Silva's going to start in, in, instead of Raul Jimenez because Jimenez often does come deep and does come out wide and will run the channels and is not the man that's going to be in the six yard box to finish off chances a lot of the time, whereas Silva is more geared towards doing that and they really like his they really like his movement in and around the box his youtube compilation is awful you know the, 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 it's the only player the, only player in europe who has a bad one well, but you, you know this this is what happens obviously when when names get touted and 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 the kids on twitter are straight onto on, onto youtube oh my god have you seen his compilation it's unbelievable sign him sign him but his is terrible it's just, it's just 10 yard finishes with, with with the inside of his foot so um but that, that 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 that's what he's good at. There's not there's not there's not, there's not that many strikers perhaps around these days. So I, I quite like that about him. And um, I had the pleasure of speaking to him actually face to face a couple of weeks ago, which is a rarity these days. You know everything's done on Zoom obviously at the moment. And I ventured to Doncaster on a Tuesday evening to go and watch him play in the Papa John's Trophy. I wasn't aware it was the the. the EFL trophy is now sponsored by Papa John's, but um, I expect him free pizza in the press box. By the way, but but no, yeah, I see. I don't. I, I don't. I don't. I don't like that as a sponsor. Like it, to me, Johnson's Pay Trophy, a, a pizza company. Well, uh, everyone, uh, everyone's everyone's got their favourite EFL trophy sponsor. Uh, uh, m- mine would be Sharper Van, uh, who, who nice, sponsored nice, Wolves nice. when they, when they won won the competition in 1988. Um, Auto windscreen shield. That was. Uh, <laughs> yeah. 
yeah, that was a good year. Was that when Birmingham won it? I remember that. Yeah, that, that was a great year. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and there was um, a Freight Rover trophy. Yes, yes. That, uh, that's, yeah. that's, 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 that's aging me a little bit. But yeah, that's, uh, I remember Bristol City winning that quite some time ago. Well, they've gone down the, the gimmicky route since, since Checker Trade, really. I think that was, that was sort of a, that was when they started going downhill. Um, and now it's, now it's Papa John's. Um, presumably free pizza for the winner. But I'm guessing instead of man of the match, maybe know. gets like a little slice, or you know, or or maybe like a maybe like a you know the the little little white table thing that they put in the middle of pizzas. Maybe you get like a silver one of those, just a, a little you know. <laughs> yeah. Back on topic. Back on topic. Fabio Silva. You went. You you <laughs> Tim. You're going to Doncaster. You go to see Fabio Silva. <laughs> Take us back on track. Um, <laughs> it was um, yeah. It was a really interesting evening actually. Wolves wolves don't really um take this competition that seriously in terms of um um playing their older senior players if you're with me sort of the 18 19 year olds either you're in Nuno's first team group or you're not and he over the past few years when players have been coming back to fitness or senior players have sort of been on the fringes he's never played them in under 23 games he hates doing that he hates sending players out on loan he never does that either he wants his first team players with him every day on the training ground not not picking up bad habits elsewhere I think is, is his general kind of feeling but he's changed approach on that this season and, and Fabio Silva was given the chance to play against Doncaster in the um, Papa John's Trophy now it was it was a weird evening it was a bizarre evening Wolves pulled in a couple of ringers for this game they played Fernando Marcel um, 31 year old ex Leon um, left back they played Keanu Hoover who they recently signed from Liverpool for Thirty million pounds, um, sorry, thirteen million pounds. Uh, John Ruddy was in goal, and then you had Fabio Silva at front, who I must, I suspect, is the most expensive player to ever play in this competition. And as as someone pointed out on Twitter, he's worth far more than the competition itself. Um, pr- <laughs> prize money is only around a couple of million pounds, and then you've got Fabio Silva worth um, thirty five million pounds. <laughs> so. But Doncaster also pulled in a couple of ringers. They had 39-year-old uh, Jamie Cop- James Coppinger in midfield. He's still and... playing. Really? Okay. <laughs> He's still, He's still and, going, um, okay. And then um, they had a centre-half, a 37-year-old centre-half, who was actually the club's manager at the time. I forget his name now. Um, used to play for Warsaw. Andy Butler. Andy Butler, yeah, former Warsaw centre-half, who was Doncaster's manager owing to the fact that Darren Moore was self-isolating. And he was playing at centre-half, marking 18-year-old Fabio Silva. A bizarre evening. But I must say, he really impressed with his attitude and, uh, you know, ran around for 90 minutes like a madman and scored two goals, really a couple of nicely well-taken finishes, which I'm sure, you know, did a bit for his confidence. And then I spoke to him afterwards. His English is, is great. And he kind of, um, he comes across as, as very humble, happy to be in Doncaster. And he was um, looking forward to, to making an impact with Nuno as soon as possible. But yeah, I was I was uh, I was really impressed with how he did. Do you think he'll be central to the solution with um, with Raul out, or is there going to be a kind of a forward line by committee situation? Do you think Do you think Nuno will just put him straight in? He has to play for now. You, you, Wolves Wolves need a pivot up front to to allow Pedence, Traore, Neto, or whoever's in to, to flourish around them. And he did. He did defend well from the front against against Arsenal. And you know his his work rate is 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 good. He wasn't really um, on the wavelength of Neto and Pedence, which you wouldn't expect at this point. But certainly for the next few weeks, he he, he has to play. And Wolves have not got any other options really. So I think they'll look at how he does, and then they'll decide in mid to late December whether they need to make an addition. You know, in in the January window and, and try and bring someone in on loan. But um, He's he's got potential. I think he's got abilities that can help Wolves right now and um, give him a chance. We'll, we'll see how he does in in the coming weeks. Throwing throwing him in at the deep end. Yeah, see if he can um, boost his YouTube compilation. Which, by the way, there, there was a very specific moment in time when I lost faith in those compilations, and it was I came across a uh, a Manuel Almunia compilation which made him look like Lev Yashin. <laughs> and I just that I, I think I, I think Fabio Silva is the only player I've ever seen who's looked worse as a result of it. It's bizarre. Go and before he improves it, go and find it. Go and dig it out. Um, we'll take a quick break and then we'll come back and we're going to talk to Tim about one of his articles. Okay, so Tim, this is going back uh, about fourteen or fifteen months now. But at the beginning of last season, when Wolves were beginning their slog through the Europa League and their um, their fixture congestion nightmare. 
you wrote a piece about all the things that happen in the immediate aftermath of a game which allow players to be ready uh, for a quick turnaround. So, uh, you know, game on Thursday away, in this case it was in Turkey, and then a, a Sunday fixture. Let's start immediately after full time. What happens What happens in the dressing room? If you go in as a player full time, what would you see? So that kind of 30, 45 minute period immediately after a match is, is a really crucial time. And immediately when you walk into the dressing room, you see this uh, uh, a banquet of terrible foods in terms of um, health and nutrition laid out before you. So the idea is immediately you've got to load up on carbs. And from what I'm told, after you've done exercise for a long amount of time, you're very hungry. You're not, you're sorry, you're, you're not very hungry. Um, so they've got to want to eat it, basically. So um, the foods are tailored to them individually. Uh, you know, I, I don't know if it's a case of, of having a menu before the game where you, you tick what options you want post-match. But... Um, but they, the, the 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 staff at Wolves there know what the players want to eat. So, for example, lots of pizzas, burgers, sandwiches, curry, um, salmon, fruit pancakes, apparently as well, um, wedges. So all this kind of stuff laid out before them, just to eat as much as you can, reload on carbs, and also protein shakes, which are again flavoured because they, they've got to want to drink them. You're not those not those nasty things you don't want to drink. So. So there's lots of that immediately. The dreaded ice baths as well. Um, I, 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 again, they kind of encourage the players to go in together to make it a social activity in the ice bath, rather than um, rather than sitting in there on your own and with a kind of an individual torture. Um, so they're, they're, it's kind of tricks of the mind, really. They, they want you to want to do these things. So they think they'll make it easier. T- Tim, your, your boiler's broken at the moment, isn't it? So you've had a few ice baths of your own, presumably. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. And Can you not walk us a... through them? How how horrible are they? <laughs> are they? Particularly when you don't actually want to have one. It's not been a very social activity either. To, to, to be honest, it's it's been <laughs> not not at all really. Um, it's been quite miserable. In fact, I scalded myself with a kettle the other day when I was, I was, I was trying to warm myself up too much. Um, <laughs> it's just this just this ludicrous situation. It's a nightmare. So yeah, so the the ice baths and then. Um, they all don these, what are known as compression garments, um, tights t- t- to the layman, um, which boost the blood flow in the legs and uh, stimulate the the lymphatic system, which kind of gets rid of waste and toxins produced by exercise. Again, trick of the mind. It's not these aren't miracle cures, but the feeling is that if the brain perceives that these are what the body needs. And, you know, you, you're taking on food, you're making yourself very cold, you're wearing tights. This must be for a reason, right? <laughs> They're always making us feel and look stupid for no reason. So it's 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 sort of a trick of the mind as well. And they, the idea is that the body sort of enters a state that, that leads to a quicker recovery. And then, yeah, after, after this after this particular game, um, as you mentioned, Besiktas us away, they, they, they flew home. Uh, immediately after the game, you know, Wolves have got the... The funds for for a private plane, so um, straight home to to Birmingham, and on the on the plane was again a, another crucial phase. Again, they have another meal. Um, this one more nutritionist. Nu- nutritionist. It's a TFA football podcast. Nutritionist will do, even if it's not a word, Tim. That's fine. <laughs> we will allow it. If it's not a word, it should be because it, it sounds right. So it does sound right, just it? go with it. And then in, anyone who's kind of got aches and aches and pains and knocks, they'll get ice machines wrapped around their legs uh, or wherever it is, you know, to kind of provide compression to the to the injured area, um, which is, I'm told, NASA esque or, or technology. Um, so it's it's very cutting and, and it relies on a big budget. You, you've got to say a lot, a lot of the things that Wolves use relies on a big budget, and, and they have got Foson's wealth and willingness, you know, behind them. So. And yet again, on this particular instance, you know, they're encouraged to sleep if if they can. I mean, I think this was about one in the morning when, when they were flying back from from Turkey, and then back in and training the next morning. And sleep's an, an important part of 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 the recovery process. Wolves place a big emphasis on it, but what they won't do after a game is after a night game in particular is send a player home, tell them to get to sleep when they can, and then say, look, have the morning off, catch up on your sleep. You know, sleep until midday and come in in the afternoon. They won't do that at all because that immediately adjusts the body clock. So they'll say, go to sleep, come in training the next morning, and then get a power nap in the afternoon. Um, so you know, 
so you're resetting you're resetting your sleep patterns immediately you know you're not falling into any bad habits or any different kind of body clocks so there's lot there's lots more to it than that but those are the kind of few key details that 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 they afforded to me is it is it quite regimented because um obviously this was a there's an article written around a game which happened in in the autumn in turkey so they've played in a very hot environment they've come into the dressing room and you know if i'm Connor Cody and I've just done 90 minutes in that kind of atmosphere in that sort of heat then maybe maybe I'd you know happily take a clip off somebody but do I want to be carb loading and eating burgers and pizza slices and, and potato wedges do, do do the coaches have to kind of be on top of the players to be like no you're going to do this now and put on your compression garment and uh why are you doing this is it, it do, do, do do players kind of fall into a um, into a kind of autopilot in that situation. The pl- the players I'm told are, are are very good at this and buy into it perhaps perhaps better than any bunch kind of wolves have had in, in in the past few years. So it has become automated and regimented, and they go through it at the start of the season. The players all sit down um, in the summer in pre season and they're talked through um, the routines that they'll have throughout that forthcoming season, so that it does become second nature. And so they're not having to think about it, you know, after they've just played 90 minutes in, in Istanbul. And a lot of it is centred around, you know, them, them kind of wanting wanting to do it. And this is kind of led by the senior pros like Conor Cody, like Joe Martino. And when they have that explanation at the start of the season, you know, they're told what the benefits will be of, of these routines that, 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 that they're asked to do. And once they see the benefits, which is in terms of feeling incredible, and, you know, I spoke to players like Matt Doherty in the past, and they've said they've, they've never felt better, they've never felt fitter, and they're not picking up injuries. Wolves' injury record is, is, is incredible. You know, 2018-19, they played 46 games, and they picked up five injuries as a squad. And not one of those five injuries saw a player out for, for more than three weeks. Remarkable. Man United picked up 61 injuries in the same, in the same season, and Wolves are down at five. And then the last season was very similar. They had the, they had the best injury injury record, and... This season, a few more, but certainly not muscle injuries. Um, so, yeah, the likes of, of Cody Martino are, are, are leading it. Uh, they're, they're, as I've said before, they're a very close-knit group. And they have the confidence to tell staff if they have got an ache or a pain or a problem, you know, rather than soldiering on and keeping it quiet and potentially making it worse down the line. They have trust in the staff and vice versa. So um, Dr. Perry, who's, who's, who's been at Wolves for, for a couple of decades, and I interviewed a couple of um, weeks ago, very important member of Wolves' backroom staff, he kind of compared it to, to wearing a seatbelt. He said, um, it's something you should do every time uh, you're in a car, and if you don't do it, you know, when you do have a crash, or if you do have a crash, you know, you, you'll, you'll, never, you'll, you'll never do it again. And he sort of compares that with injuries and the, all these routines they go through. If they don't do them, and they pick up a muscle injury the next game, then you know they'll certainly do them again after that. So, um, so yeah, it's like I said, and all these kind of tricks of the mind that they have sort of encourages the players to to, to want to do these routines. Did they? Um, one of the things your article mentioned was um, how difficult some players find it to sleep after games. The clubs have, I mean, we'll, we'll talk about Wolves specifically, but there are any ways in which they kind of try and regulate players' sleep because it never really occurred to me that sort of after after a game like that where there's such a buildup of adrenaline. I mean, in my mind, uh, you know, that kind of athletic performance is is associated with just collapsing and sleeping for 14 hours quite naturally for someone like me. But for a professional athlete, presumably you're, you get on the plane back from, in this instance, Istanbul. And I don't know how long the flight is back to um, the Midlands, maybe two or three hours possibly. Um, and if you, you could be still awake at four in the morning, do the club do anything to try and um, ensure that, the players are not sort of um, that their, their sleeping patterns are not jolted out of um, out of whack when they cross time zones. Um, I don't think they do a huge amount because they, I think they kind of feel if you do lose a bit of sleep on one night, then then it's okay to to pick it up again the next the next afternoon. And they have these kind of when they have periods of of lots of matches matches in a short in a short time frame. A guy called uh, Julio Figueroa, who's who's a really important figure behind the scenes. Um, sort of he's, he's got a curious appearance people might have noticed him on on, on the touchline at Wolves and he's a bald gentleman who wears uh, colored glasses uh, I think they've been blue and or orange in the past he's very kind of noticeable and at the moment he's he's wearing one of those uh, big visors in, instead of a mask 
um, but but still kind of wearing big glasses and goggles at, at the same time. Um, <laughs> it's a strong like, look. It's a strong, it is a strong, strong look. <laughs> Tifo so football like, encourages that look because it keeps people safe, but it is still funny. It's <laughs> but he's he's a very interesting character. He's he's on he's sort of known as a sort of a backroom staff coach, but really he's he's a mind coach, and he's someone that Wolves certainly don't really want people to know about. I think they kind of think he's. He's the hidden secret, really, behind a lot of what they do, and he's on the pitch for every training session. But but he's he's certainly no football expert. He's a professor in sports uh, psychology at a, at a university in Catalonia, I think, and used to work at Barcelona. And the players can go to him with any kind of troubles, you know, one on one sessions, psychology sessions, etc. Et but he also takes the group as a whole together um for these kind of uh, relax therapy sessions it was described to me and and lots of it is to do with stretching and he'll kind of bring the group together of an afternoon after training and get them in a big circle and then they'll he'll in a sort of a Paul McKenna type way um (laughs) sort of he'll sort of encourage them to to sleep and you I'd, I'd love to see it you know 20 um, extremely well-paid uh, footballers all kind of sat in a group nodding off together I, don't know, I can picture them sucking their thumbs and, and curling up into a ball <laughs> and he's said to be very relaxing and soothing with his voices and his messages you know he speaks sort of limited English but um, but they all kind of hang on his every word and he was said to be an important figure after the most crushing defeat that the Wolves have experienced in the past two or three years which was the FA Cup semi-final defeat to Watford at Wembley when they were 2-0 up and, and blew it in extra time 3-2 and he kind of said in the dressing room you know this this setback is not a defeat uh, this will be something that makes you hungrier to do better which uh, I guess kind of sounds like a maybe a simplistic throwaway comment but it really it had resonance with, with the players at the time it's certainly something that they remembered in, in the in the following months so yeah so sleep at any time really as, as, long, as, as long as they as long as they get enough it doesn't necessarily matter when it is he sounds like the kind of guru figure who um, had someone tried to introduce him 20 years ago, you know, with the kind of the you know, <laughs> island jury type situation, then it would have been like a headline on the back of a, a tabloid somewhere or a kind of, you know, there'd be some, there'd be some terrible anecdote in, a, in, a, in an autobiography about wanting a short back and sides and, you know, that kind of thing. Um, but when you said, um, that was interesting, when you said that uh, after that defeat to Watford, was it him in the Wembley dressing room immediately afterwards that addressed the team? I don't know if he, I don't know if he addressed the team necessarily, but he he was he certainly said that uh, in front of the group as as the coaches were were, were talking. So it's, it's interesting you mentioned about sort of maybe being slightly ahead of his time. I mean, Ian Cathro is another important member of Aussie's backroom team who kind of w- went to Scotland with these with these computers, uh, and people kind of said, "Oh no," uh, it seemed like the general kind yeah. of feeling. He was I think known as a bit of a laptop manager, wasn't he, when he was at Hearts. I remember there being some kind of punditry uh, confrontation on, like, uh, you know, the, the, the Chris Scottish Boyd, Premiership. Yeah, maybe Chris Boyd. Outraged, absolutely outraged at the idea of um, Catherine working in, like, a, an air-conditioned office with a laptop and, you know, perhaps also with a calculator. It was, um, yeah, it was a real proper football <laughs> moment. Yeah, so you, you, you've got him and there's also Antonio Diaz as well, who, who you know, really should mention is... Um, he he's he figureheads the the recovery and sports science side of it and has been involved. He's, he's sort of the brainchild between a lot of these ideas. And it sounds very simple to me, but I'm not sure how many clubs implement this. But the idea really is that the equipment they use in in the gym and and pre and post match. You know, traditionally people will kind of use linear techniques. You know, running in straight lines or lifting weights up and down. Whereas Wolves sort of really focus with their equipment on, on the movements you make in a football match, which sort of makes sense really. You know, when you're strengthening and conditioning your muscles, you'd use the same motions that you would do during during those ninety minutes. So, I think they use a lot of sort of resistance training to to protect the muscles. Lots of squat machines, lots of things on reaction times, lots of things to do with eyesight as well. I think, um, you know, they're, they're not trying to enlarge the muscles necessarily. Um, it's about conditioning your body to the movements you'll make in a game. So I think Antonio Diaz has been with Nuno for eight years and was involved in a company in Portugal which produced this kind of equipment that, that they use. So, um, so yeah, he's, again, a, a very forward-thinking and considered to be one of the best in his field. So he's, he's kind of got this group of, of 
six backroom staff who are extremely loyal to him and, and have been with him for a number of years and they kind of keep a low profile behind Nuno but um but they're certainly the brains trust you know um computing away boffin style on, on all their kind of individual areas behind the scenes and, and it's um, a very well oiled machine Hey, and endorsed by performance too. Um, we haven't really, we haven't really covered half of it actually. So do go and read Tim's article. Um, and if you're not subscribed to The Athletic, sign up at theathletic.com forward slash TIFO. Currently, there's a uh, one pound a month for 12 months subscription offer. So take advantage of that. Uh, search for Tim on the uh, on the website. And um, yeah, his article, Tim, was it sort of, was it October 2019 when that article came out? Is that about right? Yeah, early, early October. Yeah, but they beat Besiktas away on the Thursday and then they went and beat Man City away. 2-0 the following Sunday which which was perfect timing for, for the article because it kind of justified everything that, that they'd done on, on, on that Thursday night perfect perfect well go and read that and Tim thank you so much for joining us it's been fascinating and obviously um, you know, very best wishes to uh, Raul Jimenez cheers guys my pleasure <laughs>